I think last time I spoke in this arena, since then I've had a 60th birthday. And I was traumatized, and then I discovered B&Q on a Wednesday. So uh, a number of you will know exactly what I'm talking about here. You know, I think Michael Winner said that uh, leading a team is, is getting everybody to do exactly what you tell them together. And I think Jock Steen said the secret of managing a team is to keep the eight who hate you away from the three who haven't made their minds up yet. So there are some people like that, but I was with a, I was with a head teacher recently, and he said, you know what, John? He said, I've lived in a curriculum cage for two decades, and they've just opened the cage door, and they've asked me to fly away. And I'm frightened. He said, but I've discovered the secret. He said, if you hold somebody else's hand, it's, I suppose that's what you call collaborative working. What a buzz and what a journey. And so we stand at that crossroads. And I'm going to, as we stand there, ask you three questions today. And there they are. Who are we? Why do we live and work the way we do? And most of all, what might we become? So who are we? Well, I, st- I thought I'd start with your job spec. Uh, you may... You may recognize this, it may resonate with you. This was put together by a a good friend of mine called Michael Fullen. He's a professor of education over in Canada, in Toronto. And uh, he is great. I like listening listening to and reading Michael Fullen because he said, uh, people call me a guru because they can't spell charlatan. So anyone who says that is worth listening to. But he, uh, do you know what, he he also said the trouble with change is it's just one bloody thing after another. But actually, change is mandatory. Whether we grow with it, well that, he said, is optional. And do you know, I'm really excited about today. Today, it's not the start of a revolution, but it's a key moment in that revolution. You see, we have now, certainly in the head teacher group, the most trusted profession after the medical profession. And that's across the world. We also have the best trained, best led group of educators we have ever had in history. And the more I travel around working with you, I'm finding that most people now in schools are what I call threshold adventurers. Steiner said this, He said, a lust for knowledge and an ache for understanding is incised in the best of men and women, as is the calling of the teacher. There is, he said, no craft more privileged to awaken in another human being powers and dreams beyond your own, to induce in others a love for that which one loves, to make of one's inward present their future. This, he said, is a threshold adventure like no other. That really should become the anthem, I think, for this revolution. You see, we are 21st century leaders. That's what we're being told. What does it mean? It means we're preparing our kids for a world that doesn't exist. They reckon 80 to 90% of the jobs that our primary school kids will do haven't even been invented yet. They're going to have 30 to 40 jobs in their lifetime. There is no such thing as a job for life for our kids, just a job for the life of the project. And uh, they're probably going to meet their future partner online. They won't have to cruise the wine bars of Chalton anymore. (laughs) They'll be able to sit at home and Mr. and Mrs. Perfect will come to meet them. You see, they've never known a world without the internet, without broadband, without TiVo, Bevo, Love Film, Netflix, Messenger, Facebook. They're going to live on average, they reckon, till they're 95. I suppose that's why we have a pensions crisis. Although, you know, some geneticists have revised that figure to 125 because they've created genetically a mosquito that when it bites you, well, actually, a mosquito that will only produce the male of the species, which means that in a short while, the mosquito will wipe out the mosquito and along with it, one of the world's biggest killers, malaria. But I read in the Times newspaper recently that the first human being to live to the age of 200 has already been born. We are preparing our kids for an amazing world. We can't do that alone. Thomas Friedman wrote a great book called The World is Flat. He said, they are the four qualities that we're all going to need to survive in that new world. 
a world, by the way, that will probably be ruled by Brazil, Russia, India, and China. We have to have creativity. You know, Ken Robinson writes on creativity. He said, the raw material that arrives in our schools is so creative. We don't kind of, if you like, create creative people. It's already there. What we help is to bring it out in those children. You know, he was with six-year-olds, and he said to this girl, what are you doing? And she said, I'm just drawing God. Just what does it, isn't it? And he said, wow, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, well, you will in a minute. You see, the raw material is amazing. But you see, our system to date has a habit of knocking that creativity out of kids. I asked a group of year sixes recently, why do we write? The answer, to get a level four. That's a dystopian view of this wonderful thing that we call learning. And you know, ingenuity, I came across recently the best excuse I've ever heard for not doing homework. This boy said, Miss, I lost my book having a fight with a boy who said you weren't the best teacher in school. Isn't that an amazing excuse? So, you know, ingenuity is important, but there are people who still, in our system, don't believe in what we're trying to do today. You know, I came across a head teacher. He said to me rather cynically, he said, oh, yes, he said, a collaborative working. That's the temporary suspension of mutual loathing in order to access government funding. So we have, to, we have to get used to those people because in the world today, there are always people who can't see what's ahead of them. They concentrate on what won't work. So why do we live and work the way we do? Well, a kind of history lesson here. I think, you know, when, when I was teaching at the university, we talked a lot about Newtonian theory. You know, Isaac Newton was a mathematician and a scientist. He was empirical, if A, therefore B. And he had a view of creation that was that in the Garden of Eden, we let God down. And because we let him down, we should not be trusted. And that if people wouldn't do what we inspected, they certainly wouldn't do what we expected. And so people could not be trusted. And what emerged was a top-down model, keep them under control, have power over them and tell them what to do. And Sir Ken Robinson, you know, he talks about having a system now that was designed for an educational program 200 years old. It was based on the, the cultural and economic demands of the Age of Enlightenment and of the Industrial Revolution. And you know what categorized that system? One, that we had a model of intelligence that was about some kids have it, some don't have it. There are sheep, there are goats, there are academic, non-academic. I suppose, in a way, it's still the A-level vocational courses debate. But he said, what characterized that whole system were two things, standardization and compliance. And this revolution is seeing those as the enemy. And you know, Estelle Morris talks about the inspection system very articulately. You see, up to the 70s, I mean, in 1974, I, became, I took a vow of poverty and I became a teacher. And I remember the inspection kind of stopped at the school gate in the 70s. In the 80s, it changed, but it's, it came into the school, but it stopped at the head's office. And then in the 90s, it finally got into the classroom. And, and we started to suffer for, if you like, more and more and more inspection. And so we learned to just do as we were told. And what defined us, I think, and this is Estelle Morris's uh, thinking, what defined us is that we, we tended to look up for inspiration. We also looked up to know what the rules were. Upward looking defined us. And Michael Barber tells a similar story. He talks about in the 70s, we had this thing called uninformed professionalism. You know, we were, we were good at what we did, but we didn't really have any idea about whether it was working or not. And then we went into an era in, the, era in the 80s of prescription, but it was uninformed prescription. We weren't quite sure. And then in the 90s, we got into an area of informed prescription. We actually had the data. We started to understand what we were all about. But you know, that's, that's the history lesson. 
Because that will determine your thinking in terms of what we might become. That depends on your mindset. Do you have a fixed or a growth mindset when it comes to systems-led thinking? Self-improving schools. You see, I came across a guy who was getting a lot of grief at home from his wife for leaving tea and coffee rings in the wooden furniture. I get a little bit of grief uh, at home over this. And he, with a fixed mindset, could have gone out and bought coasters. But this guy is in a growth mindset. He gave the world the floating mug. Do you know, he put that on the internet, and apparently within two days he had about £60,000 worth of investment, mainly from men. So we have to approach this whole philosophy with what I call a growth mindset. And there has been a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is this. We've started to agree with Alfred North Whitehead, who wasn't like Isaac Newton. Whiteheadian philosophy was based on a notion that creation isn't finished. It's ongoing. We are in control of it and that people can be trusted. And the leader is the person with the best idea. Does that sound familiar? And uh, this, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks said there were four levels of happiness. The first level is kind of personal gratification. I'm thirsty, I drink, I'm hungry, I eat. The second level was the respect of your peer group. It's nice to be liked and respected by the people around you. But the third level of true happiness was when you took a joy in the success of other people, a notion of, of servant leadership. The fourth level, he said, well, the ancient Greeks said that that was probably only available to maybe a bunch of Buddhist monks on a Himalayan peak somewhere a deeper spiritual level, but it is the third level that makes us happy. And uh, we've redefined our purpose. This is exciting. You see, a hundred years ago, the purpose of education was to educate a small group of rich boys to control what we did. And then we started to educate the girls, as long as they weren't really putting the boys under pressure. And if you like, the tripartite system post-war, you know, in, in, in those three groups, we gave a fantastic education to the top 20% of kids. But you know, and Estelle Morris again said, that we are the first cohort of teachers that society has asked to take all the kids to the highest level possible. What a threshold adventure that really is. Every child matters, no child left behind. And it's our chance. This is the crossroads. We've got a chance here to seize the middle ground. What do I mean by that? Well, I think our government, with its big society philosophy, has kind of been uncomfortable with top-down thinking. It's, it's talked a lot about Whiteheadian philosophy. And, and what, what the government has done is it's kind of systematically removed the middle tier. The demise of Bechter, the TDA, the GTC, Partnership for Schools. So that middle ground is available for us. We have got the chance of a lifetime to seize it. Are we up to it? Well, that depends on whether you trust the system whether you trust yourself and whether you're a, a threshold adventurer. And you know, Michael Barber again, we've reached the age, he said, now of informed professionals. We know what we're doing. We have the data that feeds back to us and reflects back to us the success or not of what we're doing. We're a new breed. And uh, we're a breed of possibility thinkers. You see, I come across still some poverty thinkers. I met a primary head not long ago, and I said to him, how are you? He said, breathing. I mean, it, it was like, I felt like slashing my wrists. I tried to cheer him up. I said, it's Friday. He said, I hate Fridays. <laughs> Why? They're too near Mondays. Isn't that terrifying? And, uh, the, but the, I also come across probability thinkers. 
You know, probability thinkers are kind of pleasantly bewildered by the whole thing. And they are looking for, you know, collaborative people to come and support them along the way, someone to hold their hand. You know, a bit like, a bit like the poor boy who wondered why his sister had three brothers, but he only had two. So we have, we have the chance here to become possibility thinkers. And what defines a possibility thinking, thinker in terms of the school-led system? Well, you know, we love constructive conflict. We love having debates. We like to talk about things. We like and enjoy falling out occasionally because we don't want collaboration to be a comfort zone. We don't want it to be what I call the turnover of the familiar. Not all collaboratives are good, you know. We sometimes think we stick that banner on it, it's good. It's, some of them are just comfort zones. Comfort zones are warm, pink and fluffy, and nothing grows there. You know, if, if, two, if two people are doing the same job, you know, and, uh, and they, they always agree, then one of them is useless. And if two people do the same job and they always disagree, then both of them are useless. But constructive, constructive conflict is important in a school-led system. And so is the unconditional support of senior leaders. You know, as a head teacher, I quickly realized that I couldn't make everything happen, but I could certainly stop anything happening that I didn't want to happen. You know, and we have to as well, in our new system, we have to learn, or we have to lose rather, the, the desire or the need to always be right, to always be certain, and always be in charge. And we've got to really share unselfishly, and we've got to poach relentlessly. I think that's the new world that we're going to live in. I want you to turn to the person next to you now, just for one minute, and say, what was that all about? You've got one minute, off you go. Okay, can I have you back? So, do you know what? What is really exciting for me is in, just in the last few months, I've, uh, I've just been, well, touring around, get, doing conferences, working with people, doing some coaching and so on. And what, what, a, what excites me so much is, it isn't that the revolution hasn't started yet, we're right in the middle of it. And, and if I get, you know, look, I'm today I'm working with the, the Teaching Schools Alliance. You know, I, uh, I've just done a big conference up in Sheffield with, uh, with Schools Direct. These are people who are taking control of their own destiny. You know, I'm a governor at an all-through academy that has a primary, secondary, and special school on its campus. I I've worked with federated schools. I've worked with academy trusts, and I'm a governor at the Everton Free School. You know, I, I know when, when Everton first said to me, would I help them write a bid in a bid team to, to get a free school? I said, well, two things. I'm not sure where I stand politically on free schools. And two, the world does not need a school for elite footballers. But you know what Everton wanted to do? They said, we want to take all the teenagers that have basically failed in the system, that some schools have thrown away, and we want to breathe life back into them. We want, well I worked with mathematics specialist teachers, whole group of people who were retraining to become mathematics specialists. I worked uh, just last Saturday with about 120 governors in Bolton, the Bolton Learning Alliance where the local authority and head teachers are getting together and they're doing some great creative work and the governors are on board with that too. And the NCTL National College for Teaching and Leadership is amazing. You know, and I know Charlie is passionate about this because we've shared the platform a few times, Charlie. And you know, Charlie sp has spoken most articulately about the two real aims of the NCTL, and that is to put world-class people in front of our kids. And the second thing is to help schools to help schools to get better. I know he is particularly passionate about that. And I've worked with some colleagues who are working on the Teaching Leaders Programme. 
What I like about that is whole networks of triads of middle leaders who are the future leaders in our system. And do you know what I like particularly? It's about sharing good practice. It's not, well, your school is better than ours. You tell me what to do. We're all good at this, and we're all sharing what we need to. There is no hierarchy. And my daughter, Elizabeth, goes in Salford to the local comprehensive school, and it's a teaching school. That really matters to me. They are doing some amazing work across the local authority and across the region. So the world is shifting. And what I want that last story to remind you about is why you are here. Mike's already asked you the question. What are you doing here? Hey, why did you come back in September? You were having a great time. But you came back. You see, what matters through today, the golden thread through today, is to remember that we're here for our children. That's the golden thread. And we're here to create and enable the Sid Pictons of the world to succeed with our kids. Sid Picton was Ian Wright's teacher. Sid Picton believed in Ian Wright. Ian Wright, I'm not sure, I I still think he's the the, the biggest or the highest goal scorer uh, Arsenal ever had. But there was an occasion when he actually thought Sid Picton had died. And one day in the football stadium, Sid Picton came to see him. That's why he came back in September. That's why we're here. And that's why what we're doing has to work. But my million dollar question to you really is, how committed are you to this? To the self-improving school? To the school-led system? How committed are you? Yeah, I did some work on commitment once, and, uh, and I suppose the first level of commitment is you turn up. You know, that's why Woody Allen said the world is run by people who turn up. Here you are. And there are some people who turn up to meetings of the collaborative or the federation or the cluster, whatever they turn up to. But you know, there's a lot more than just turning up. There are some people in our staff rooms, unfortunately, you know, they turn up, but that's often all they do. They sit there in the same chair for decades. You know, they morph into cynics. A cynic is someone who's given up, but they haven't shut up. You know those people. Or they've retired, but they haven't told the principal yet. You know those people. So yes, we have to be there physically, but there is so much more to it. We have to turn up cognitively as well. And that is we're there to share our expertise and our ideas and our thoughts and all those things from the cognitive world. You know, but I often say to teachers, do you know children will forget most of what we make them think, but they'll never forget how we made them feel. I bumped into kids all over the world now that I used to teach, and not one of them has said, hey, sir, that worksheet changed my life. And I spent hours on those worksheets. Put your hand up if you remember the Banda machine. Look at that, it's an, age, it's an age profile test, isn't it? About a third of the room started doing that as soon as I said it. Do you remember the smell? Great, at the back of the queue when they changed the Banda fluid. What a joy that was. Do you know by the time you got to the front of the queue, you were high as a kite? You know, apparently somebody told me it's a band category B substance now. So we have to turn up physically and we have to turn up cognitively. But you know what the kids want? You know what the staff want from their leaders? They want us to turn up emotionally. They want us to turn up with our heart and soul. That is so important. Caring collaboratives, collaboratives of the heart, whatever you want to call them. It's that personal support that matters as much as anything else. Because for some people in this room, times are really difficult. And to be able to count on, you know, the people in the room around you who know that you're vulnerable, who will make sure you're okay. Do you know, I came across a lovely story recently. It was a guy who was talking to his friend about his wife. His wife has Alzheimer's. And very reluctantly, after a a period of time, he found he had to put her in a home. But every day for two years, that guy has gone to that home, made them breakfast in the morning, and they have breakfast together. 
His friend was hearing this story with this and not this. And his friend said, does she know you? And this guy said, well, she hasn't known me for some time now. And his friend said, well, how can you have breakfast every morning with somebody who doesn't even remember you? And this guy said, oh, she can't remember me, but I can remember her. You see, we have to turn up on all three levels and be totally committed to what we're doing. And I had the fortune, the good fortune of having a meal with, uh, with Frank Dick some years ago. What a great guy. He was the British Olympic coach. He's a Scotsman, passionate. And uh, he was, well, I was talking to him about teamwork. I said, you know, you know, we have this thing called collaborative working, you know, where we have groups of people who are going to take over the system. You know, what can I tell them about great teams, Frank? Because you work with great teams. And he said, tell them first of all what I always told my teams, that it's about the badge on the shirt. You know when you join a cluster, a collaborative, a group of people, even informal or formal groups, you start wearing a badge on the shirt and you play for that badge. Do you know what he said? He said you can play for the name or you can play for the badge, but you can't play for both. What a great message for all of us there. And he said, and the second thing is the number on your shirt. That's the role you're asked to play in this system. Are you up for it? Or do you hide away when some uncomfortable things have to be done? Because you want to go to meetings, but that's all you want to do, really, just to keep your eye on things. Or are you prepared to play key roles in that team? And he said, but most of all, he said, most of all, it's about the you in the shirt. That you, the you that you brought to this arena today, he said, tell them that attitude is 80% of performance. It's all about interpersonal skills. It's about humanity, even at the highest level of sport. And then he said something interesting. He said, I've got lots of interpersonal skills. And I thought, that was a bit big-headed over the chips, Frank. He said, you can't grow up in Scotland with a name like Dick and not develop interpersonal skills. He said, and then the Queen gave me the OBE, and now I'm OB Dick. <laughs> but when people like Frank Dick are championing what we're doing here in our evolution, it is time to listen. Do you know, down along some distant day, we're going to sit down with our grandchildren on our knee, and they're going to say, Grandad, how did you manage to give us a world-class education system. And you know the answer? We did it ourselves. Thanks for listening.